Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We believe at Deep Adventure Ministries that the most radical thing you can do in life is abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. We'll be right back with our guest, our guest John Edwards, and we're talking about manly virtue. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. When I say that when we say that the most radical thing you can do in life is abandon yourself to the wildness of God's will, God's wild. You know, look at just look at quasars, look at black holes, look at dinosaurs. And when we say we're going to go out into the wilderness to be close to God, it's wild out there. Are you sure you want to get close to that God? God's bigger than you. He's a dangerous dude, and uh, but he loves you, and he's on the hunt for you. And, uh, and he has a beautiful, beautiful plan for your life, and he wants to introduce himself to you and for you to be his son, to be his child, and to walk with him. And that's where it gets radical, because when you walk with the Lord, you get to see God do stuff. Sometimes God just sits there, too, and doesn't do anything. It seems like, come on, God, aren't you going to do this? We need your help. You need for me to do this. And God says, yeah, the cake isn't ready yet. We're going to wait a little bit. But the Lord moves in powerful ways, and he also moves in silent ways, and... Uh, but be assured God is working in your life to bring you closer to him and bring you into the fullness of joy. I have a friend of mine, uh, Luke Rogers. He's Aaron Rogers' brother, and he has tattooed on his ribs. Uh, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And so uh, that's what we're talking about. That's why I have our guest John Edwards with us. Aloha, John. Say, say aloha to uh, the, the Deep Adventure Ohana out there. Aloha. Thank you for having me, Bear, and, and thank you all for listening today. Hey, you guys, you've got to see this guy. I mean, if you see him, you can tell the Lord, he's fired up for the Lord. So if, if you want to see him, our YouTube channel, the Bear Wozniak YouTube channel, go go there and subscribe, and you'll you'll get our video podcast. But um, just to see John makes you get fired up. This is, Whatever this, this, this time is going to be with him, it's going to be awesome. John, can you give us just a little backstory, um, where your walk with the, the Lord and and then we'll, I want to get into your, your ministry, your, your, your call sure. to men, men to virtue. Sure, yeah. So I was born and raised here in Memphis, Tennessee. It's where I still live. I've lived here my whole life, um, you know, in the land of Elvis and barbecue. So I was here my whole life. I was born and raised Baptist uh, and, and spent from the time I was young all the way up to about the age of 18 in the Baptist church. I mean, it's where I love to be. There was a community, a family there, uh, kids that I grew up with. All through that, the youth group was sort of my home. And, you know, I was evangelizing at a young age and going on mission trips and vacation Bible schools and all of these things. And about the time I was 18, everybody went away to college. That whole community of, of, of folks that I'd grown up with is really my family. Here in the South, we're surrounded by all these SEC schools. A lot of people's parents went to these schools, so they follow in their footsteps and leave. Well, at 18, for the first time in my life, community was just gone. I had nobody except my parents and, and you know my sisters left in my life and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I wasn't one of these guys that said I want to be a lawyer or a doctor and and you know I was 8 years later. I had no idea what I wanted to be. Um, I enrolled at the University of Memphis uh, here in town where I was from and for the first time in my life I, I just I felt very alone. You know, one of this college campus I was surrounded by thousands of people but didn't know a soul. You know, there were pretty girls in the classroom I was trying to talk to. Didn't get, a, didn't have a lot of luck there. Um, I noticed that they were talking to guys in, you know, shirts with Greek letters on them. So I thought, uh. well, maybe if I get one of those, then then I can, you know, some of these ladies will talk to me and maybe I'll make some friends. So I joined a fraternity and bear, that was the last time that I went to church for about 10 years of my life. Mm. Yeah, you know, I started drinking. I started uh, living very promiscuously. Uh, I did every drug you could think of from smoking pot to ecstasy, LSD, pills, all of these things. But I'll never forget the day in my life that I made the worst decision of my life, which was to do cocaine. Uh, you see, I tell young people when I talk to them a lot at, at high schools and things, and there is, they're preparing to go to college, that freedom's a good thing. They're always looking forward to leaving and being their own person and 
getting away from mom and dad and living their own life. And that's all good and great if you know who you are. Mm. And see, Bear, I forgot who I was and all that. I forgot my identity as a beloved son of God. I went into college and I started trying to be what everybody else wanted me to be because I'd lost this community that where my identity was in that youth group. And all I wanted was to be back in community. So I would do whatever was necessary to be liked, to be loved, all of those things. So I'd been working at Napa Auto Parts since I was 16 years old. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. And my father worked there for 45 years. Are you a car guy then or what? You, yeah, you... I, I am. I mean, I, I'm a little dangerous with uh, working on one every once in a while. NASCAR so. type stuff or, or what? No, no, just, I mean, I watch NASCAR and stuff like that, but I'm more of a, more of a tinker around the house doing brake jobs, stuff like that. Oh, that's so cool. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, but all that I learned through this whole process of working there, but so I started working there at 16. I worked my way up from loading trucks on a dock and I was working as the uh, shipping manager at the time. And I was making about 30 grand as a 20 year old kid in college. So no bills and lots of money. So that just what that spelled That's a recipe for this, disaster, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This guy's got money. So that meant that I could buy drugs. I could buy alcohol. I had a car to go places and plenty of gas money. So I became everybody's best friend. And I thought I had these brothers for life. Well, bear that one day uh, I was watching football with these guys on a Sunday and we'd been drinking beer all day and it was time to go home. And I was really nervous about driving. I walked to the back of the house to go to the bathroom and heard some of the guys in another room when I opened the door, they were in there doing cocaine. And I sort of have one of those moments where you go, okay, I'm back in the back seat of my parents' car saying, I'll never drink, I'll never do drugs. And I'll, I'd already broken a lot of those, but this was like the one you saw on an after school special. You know, you do this and you're done for your life. But as I said, I've been drinking a lot. I was really under the influence. I went back there and I did some, and I went home that night. I felt like I could run through a wall. It was the craziest feeling I ever felt in my life. Well, I told myself after that night, no more. I did it to get home that night. I never want to do it again. I felt terrible about it. Well, that next Friday, I met up with those same guys and they were uh, now doing it out in front of me because I guess they mm -hmm. thought they didn't have to hide it anymore. So it was right there and I fell again to peer pressure. And next thing you know, I started doing this all the time. Well, at the same time, I was rising at work. I basically flunked out of school because I was partying and drinking and carrying on and not going to class. So my dad quit paying for school and said, you got to go to work at Napa full time now. So that's what I did. And I excelled all the way through this. I, I left the dock. I went into a store. Then I became an outside salesman. I was making six figures. I was outside salesman of the year for that Fortune two, uh, 250 company several years. And I had what looked like from the outside looking in the perfect life, plenty of money, whatever I wanted, cars, house, all that stuff. But I was a broken mess inside. Nobody knew that I'd become addicted to, to cocaine and I was doing it almost every night. You know, I got to the point in my life where I was drinking 15, 18 beers, smoking a pack and a half of cigarettes and doing a 40 bag of cocaine every night. You know, um, this was from the outside looking in, right? Everything was going well at work, everything else. Well, obviously I wasn't meeting a lot of women in my life. I was very lonely. I was alone. I wanted to get married. And one night I ran into a girl at, at a bar with uh, my friends that I'd known in college and hadn't seen in years. We sat down and started talking. Next thing you know, we went on a date the next night. A year later, we decided to get married. And Bear, at this point in my life, like I, I was thinking, okay, this is it, right? I, all these other things, I should have already matured out of this, but this is it. Now I'm gonna get married. I can't keep doing the same things I was doing. Well, she was a Catholic girl and she told me somewhere along the way that the man I'm gonna marry is gonna be Catholic. So I figured I was the man for the job. And I went to the first RCIA class I could find and signed up. Um, but as I said, I hadn't been to church, I hadn't been to church in 10 years or so. So I really wasn't practicing any sort of faith until then. Uh, but the drugs didn't stop. Right. I just, I hid them from Angela all when we were dating, uh, even, even in the, into the years of our marriage, I wound up having a 17 year addiction to cocaine. And, uh, along the way we had a, a son, Jacob, who's now almost 12. I had my two daughters, Caitlin and Alice, and they're identical twin girls, all of them healthy, even though. I continued to do the drugs during conception, all of these things. Um, you know, I kept thinking, all right, I'm, I'm getting a son. I've always wanted to be a father. I'm getting a son first. This is it. I'll stop. Didn't stop. You know, I'm getting two daughters. I'm going to stop. But now I got to grow up. Didn't stop. You know, it just kept getting worse and worse and bare along the way. My mother passed away of cancer unexpectedly, uh, very quickly. And it wrecked me. And I just looked at God and, and said, Lord, why would you take someone like her? a good church going, God fearing, loving woman 
and leave somebody like me to exist on this planet. It doesn't make sense to me, God. Why would you take her and not me? And so, Bear, I told God right then and there on that spot that I hated him and I'd never worship him. I'd never spend any time with him again, that he wasn't my friend, and I never would give a care about him again in my life. As you can imagine, when my mother died, I went down into the spiral of drugs and alcohol even more. I mean, I was drinking a case of beer a night. I was doing more drugs. I was an absentee father. The only time I was ever a good father is when I wanted to be, and that was very rare. Mm. You know, I was nowhere near a good husband. My wife and I were basically roommates. You know, I'd come home, I'd make dinner, and then I'd plant myself in front of the TV with ball games and beer all night. And uh, my wife would just go back to bed, you know, and not even expect me to spend time with her. Well, Barry, one of these nights I was sitting there at about two in the morning. And uh, next thing I know, I get up to go to bed. I fall asleep very quickly. But then all of a sudden, I'm thrown up out of the bed, and I feel like my heart's going to explode out of my chest. Uh, and I start thinking, this is it. You know, I, I've pushed this way too far. This is the moment you always see in movies. I'm going to die. I'm going to have an overdose. I'm going to have a heart attack. I fell out of the bed. My wife didn't wake up. I crawled to the bathroom, pulled myself up on the toilet. And I just sat there just rocking back and forth, just going, no, 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 no. Please don't let me die. Please don't let me die. Please don't let me die. And I remembered um, how to slow my breath. I put my, my face in a towel and I realized I was having a panic attack. Well, let, so let's I slowed let, let, my breathing. Let's take yeah. a little bit of a break. Sure. Hey, hey, John, when we come back, we'll find out if you if you live it or not. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a cliffhanger, right? So you always want to, you know, take a break on a cliffhanger. Sure, this is the Bear there you Wozniak, go. This is the Bear Wozniak adventure. We want to say a special shout out to the mama bears out there. There's nothing more fierce than a mama bear. I used to have a cabin up in the Rockies, up in Montana, and we would come across them a couple of times with a woman with her with her bears, with her cubs. And so we give a shout out to those mama bears. They're not the soft, cuddly ones that what we think of sometimes, but the mama bears out there that are praying the rosary. Uh, encouraging and challenging their men to go deeper with God. We're here for you, and we love you and want you to become part of our ministry. You can go to deepadventure.com and, and find out how you can become a mama bear. Uh, and we'll, we also have an outreach for the men. We'll talk about that when we come back. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be back in just a, just a moment. Hey, man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out. Mahalo for your kokua in supporting us. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to you, our listeners, for supporting the Bear Wozniak Adventure radio show at deepadventure.com. We would not be able to bring you our radio show with its uniquely powerful and gritty outreach without your help. You can become part of our pack. You can support our ministry by going to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak or by just going to deepadventure.com and clicking on the Patreon link and become a part of our outreach. That's deepadventure.com. Once again, mahalo for your kokua. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite the men out there to join Bear's Man Cave. It's a, it's a kind of group of misfits, kind of knuckle draggers, but all men that want to go deeper with the Lord. Uh, we think of ourselves as kind of like the Cave of Adullam where King David and his band of misfits, that's what the Bible calls them, joined together. They were running from the law, running from their mother-in-law, running from, 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 uh, from debt or whatever, and they gathered there, and the, the Lord, along with each other, uh, formed formed and, and developed themselves into the mighty men of valor. And that's why we encourage men everywhere to become part of a, a men's group. And uh, we have Bear's Man Cave uh, for many of the men who come and join us. 
uh, it, we help them start their own men's group. So uh, consider joining Bears Man Cave. You can do that at deepadventure.com and grow in valor and grow in virtue. We're talking with John Edwards, and where we left off, John, you were talking about how you pretty much were at a point where you felt like you were going to die. You'd been you had you yeah. been down a tri- down a road of drug, sex, and rock and roll, and the drugs were um, were about to kill you. Yeah. Yeah, so I was sitting there on that commode where I pulled myself up just to sit, and I remember saying to myself, I need to tell my wife to call an ambulance, but I remember also saying I'd rather die right here than her find out what's been going on in my life. I'll lose everything. I'll lose her. I'll lose my job. I'll lose my kids. I'll lose everything. You know, I was a guy that had bought into the lie of the world that, you know, being a man was amassing all of these things, and I checked all these boxes I was supposed to check. I didn't want to lose that. But I was able to slow my breath. I was able to get back in the bed and go to sleep. And the next morning I got up, I poured out the drugs and said, I'm done. Well, 4.30 the very next afternoon, I was back buying drugs again from the same dealer. I was doing it again that same night, the, the very next night. Again, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, get up, go to bed, fall asleep very quickly, which is unusual with cocaine. But I'm thrown up out of the bed again and my heart's doing the same thing. Same scene, fall to the floor, cl- crawl to the toilet, sit there, slow my breathing again. And I said, you know what? I don't think I'm going to get too many more strikes. God, you know, I'm not in a good place with you. I I told you I hate you and I still do, but I know that I've got to change my life or all of this is going to come crumbling down. So my father-in-law was uber Catholic. He was always trying to get me to, to do all of this Catholic stuff. And we had a men's conference here in Memphis that had been put on for 15 years or so. Um, And I had never gone with him. I went one time with father, when father Larry Richards was here, and it didn't really take. Uh, he was even as good as a speaker as he is. It just didn't take with me. You know, the drugs had too much of a grip on me. But I knew it was coming up that next weekend, and I was going to go because I remembered you could go to confession there. I'd only been to confession once, and that was in RCIA and 10 years of being Catholic. I was now 37 years old. And I go to that conference. I don't remember who was speaking there, but I went and did the walk of shame, going down the hallway, looking at all the different priests on the door and going, nope, I know him, nope, I know him, nope, the ones, I know the him. The ones that were hearing confession? Yeah, they were hearing confession. So I wound up um, picking this name I didn't know, and it said he was from out of town. He had his base full Mississippi or something. So I went in there, and I sat down, and I and I told this guy the truth. You know, for the first time in my life, I was able to tell the truth because, Bear, I had lied so much, like, I couldn't even keep up with it anymore. You know, mm-hmm. I had all these different masks I wore everywhere in my life, at the bar, at school, at, at church, at work, you know, and, and it was just I couldn't keep up with it all. So I was able to to share all of this. And I remember he, you know, at the end, I said, I I want to change my life, but I don't want to get in trouble. And he said, son, that's not up to you. If you want God's mercy, you don't get to quantify how that's going to come. You know, you just need to be sorry for your sins. Are you sorry for your sins? I'm crying, all this stuff. I said, yes, I am. I am. Please just I want absolution. So he gave me absolution. I made my mind up to walk out of that room and change my life. And that lasted for about four days. That next week was Holy Week. Uh, I was an outside 100% commission salesman at that point. I had a customer I've been working on for about a year that was going to buy about 250 grand worth of shop equipment for his for his automotive repair shop. He called me that day. It was Holy Thursday and said, Get, you know, go ahead and bill it, send it. So it was more money than I'd made all year in that one invoice that I sent out. So something went off of my head and said, it's time to celebrate. You know, endorphins started firing off. I knew I'd made a promise to God, but I wanted to celebrate. So I called that dealer and he didn't answer. And I called and I called and called. Finally he answered. I stopped by his house. I went in, got my usual 40 bucks, started down the street. Next thing you know, I pull in the gas station and there's the DEA behind me. Uh, they yank me out of the car. They find the drugs. They throw me in the back of a Tahoe, take me to downtown uh, jail in Memphis, which is one of the most dangerous cities crime wise in the country. Uh, not the place you want to go to jail, especially if you've never been in trouble in your life. I'm sitting in the back of this cop car and, and one of the cops looks at me and he says, son, you look like you've never been in trouble in your whole life. And I said, I haven't. I've made mistakes. I, I've made bad decisions. I just want to tell my wife where I am. I was supposed to be getting my son. It's been hours. She's got to be worried. So he gets my phone. He dials my wife. He puts it to my ear and he says, you can't hold it, but you can talk to her. She answers the phone and she said, John, where are you? Oh my gosh, I'm so worried. And I told her, I said, Angela, I'm in the back of a police car arrested for possession of cocaine. And she said, I hate you. And she hung up the phone. I didn't blame her bear. I mean, she knew something was going on in my life and she finally had her answer. You know, I was taken into jail from there. Uh, I saw a lot of bad stuff that I won't get into here, but 
basically put on the scrubs, was taken to a cell at four in the morning. That cell door slides open. I see two bunk beds that are covered in junk. You know, I throw a blanket over them and put a blanket over myself. And by the grace of God, I passed out. I look back as that iron door was shutting before I fell asleep and just thought my life's over and put, put the blanket over my head. Next morning, I woke up. I was still laying on my stomach. It was dark. I was under the blanket I, and I thought I'd had a nightmare. I said, oh, good. Thank you, Lord. I'll change my life. I get it. I get it. Just please don't let that happen to me. I sat up. My head hit the bottom of a steel bunk bed. Mm. I threw my legs over the side and looked up and there was a cinder block wall about four feet in front of me, stainless steel toilet. And I began to realize it wasn't a dream. I started to shake and rock back and forth just like I did on that on that commode. And I just started saying, no, 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 no. I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to lose my job, my wife, my kids, everything I love. I'm going to lose everything. And then bear the craziest thing happened. This undescribable feeling of peace came over me in a place where I should not have felt any peace. Mm. And the truest things that I said, I think I've ever said in my life came out of my mouth. And I said, well, at least now I don't have to lie anymore. At least now everybody will know who I am. Mm. And when I said that, it's like the weight of the world fell off of me. And I began to look at what had happened in my life and where I'd gotten to. And I began to think about the things I'd said to Jesus and to God about how I hated them. I began to realize I'd turned my back on God and I'd put myself in this situation. And it was like Jesus was there with me with his arm around me. I kept saying, I was crying and just saying, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I treated you this way. I'm so sorry I turned my back on you. I'm, I'm so sorry for the person I've become. And it was like he was just sitting there saying, John, you needed me to be that in your life, right? I took those things from you because that's what you needed in your life at that moment. But now I need something from you. And so, Bear, I sat there and I had the longest conversation I've ever had in my life with him for hours. And he basically just told me, I need you to be the man that I created you to be. I had no idea what that meant. I had no idea how to live it anymore. But all I knew is that when I got out of that jail cell, my goal in my life was to be the husband and the father I always should have been. I didn't care about my job. I didn't care about anything else. I just wanted an opportunity to make things right with my family. So I get a visitor and, and, and it's my wife. Turns out she was down there bailing me out. She's sitting there, it's the scene from Law and Order. I'm in one side of the glass with the pay phone. She's on the other. Her mother, my mother-in-law was there. They're both crying, I'm crying. And she says, John, first thing I want you to know is I'm not gonna divorce you. It has nothing to do with you, but everything to do with the vows I made to God. My wife is an angel. She's appropriately named Angela. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be here. This whole story that I'm telling you, there's two heroes in it, Jesus Christ and my wife. I'm not mm -hmm. one of them, I just get to tell it. But I wound up getting out of jail that night. I had to go stay with my dad. My wife wasn't ready for me to come home. My dad shows up outside of the jail. I had a, a father that was raised on a farm, a lot of tough love, wasn't a lot of I'm proud of you or I love you growing up, scared to death when I went out to meet him. And he grabbed me and gave me the words I'd long for to hear all my life is, I love you, son. Are you okay? Mm -hmm. We talked about my mom. We drove down to his farm in Mississippi where I stayed for the weekend. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in 10 years, I had a desire to go to mass. You know, I'd, I'd done everything for 10 years to fight that. I was too hungover most of the time. But on that Easter Sunday morning, I got out of jail on Good Friday. And then I go to, to mass on Easter Sunday. And when I go to this small Catholic church in this little town of Bruce, Mississippi, which I'd been once to five years before, this priest, as I'm leaving the mass, comes up and, and grabs my shoulder. I turn around and he remembers my name from five years before. He says, hello, John. I said, I don't know why you're here alone, where your family is. But God wants me to tell you everything's going to be all right. Mm. And Bear, it was right then and there that I said, this is it. Like, I'm going to change my life. I don't know what it means, but I'm going to be different. And so I went home that next Monday, the day after that Easter Sunday, went to court, went to work and explained everything to them. And I checked myself into a behavior science center. And my wife, again, we hadn't talked all that weekend since I went to my dad's. She shows up in the waiting room and says, I can't let you go through this alone. Powerful. She continues to walk with me through all of this. Mm. And um, shortly after that, she let me come home that night. Uh, she wouldn't sleep in the bed with me. Obviously, she was hurt. She was sleeping across the hallway in my son's room. But I realized looking at that empty bed that I couldn't just quit doing the drugs and the alcohol. I had to be different. I had to give my life back to God. So I began to look for Bibles and stuff on no. my side of the bed. I should have looked on her side of the room. we, we, got, we got to take a break for a second. <laughs> We're talking with John, sure. with John Edwards. I hate to interrupt you, but... Uh, we're going with he's just the guy in the pew as i as i, as I understand it um yeah. there's a lot of just guys in the pew that 
God is calling to step out and to be men. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. John, if people want to find you, what's what's the website? You can go to justaguyinapew.com and find everything we're doing there. Okay, we'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. Men. Yes, we mean you. Go to deepadventure.com and check out Bear's Man Cave, a men's only Facebook group. Join the pack with other men as they challenge and inspire one another to manly virtue. Plus, you can dialogue with us in our regular video chat meetups. Plus, get your exclusive content. Join at deepadventure.com. That's deepadventure.com. Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite everybody to, uh, we got to let you know, the Long Ride Home TV show that's on EWTN. We just sent them season three. Should be airing soon. And it's also... Uh, available on Prime Video. So if you want to power watch it, you can do that. But also, if you become a, a donor to the to our ministry, we send you all the videos for Long Ride Home, so you can uh, so you can power watch it with your friends and family. You know you know what I'm talking about, Mama Bears. You kind of accidentally have our t our show on uh, when you're having uh, your son-in-law over, and pretty soon he's watching a motorcycle show, and pretty soon he's kind of like realizing, hey, this is about me and this is about God. And uh, it's a challenge to go deeper with the Lord. So uh, you can go to deepadventure.com and find all that out. We're talking with John Edwards. He's just a guy in a pew, and he was talking about his his conversion. Um, there's a there's a uh, when, when I used to sail, I normally sailed alone. I think people said I'm not going to go sail with that guy. <laughs> so I'd go, I'd, I had a little I had a little Catalina, 27 foot Catalina. And I would sail, and one of the things that, that people who sail alone do, or most people who sail do, they'll trail a rope out the back of that boat, um, along, along maybe a while over 100 feet, maybe 200 foot, and about every 10 feet there's a knot. Um, and at the very end there's a, there's a knot, and sailors for centuries have called it the bitter end. And it's, it's trailed behind the boat in case you fall out, maybe you'll grab a hold of that rope and be able to pull yourself in. Um, the Lord gave uh, John Edwards many opportunities when he fell out of the boat. He'd grab onto the knot, and then he would let go. But this time in his life, he was right at the bitter end. And uh, and t tell us about about this this uh, Jesus. You know, he's in the Savior biz, isn't he? That's what he sure. does, right? Yeah. 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 So tell tell you were telling us about that moment when you went back to your home now after having been yeah. in, in in jail and your wife bailing you out. The worst thing could ever happen to a man. And, yeah. and what happened? Yeah. So I was I was laying there in the bed and I began to look at the empty spot next to me and knew I had to change my life. I saw the shape of my wife and my son's bed across the hall and I just said, this can't stay this way. So I began to look for a Bible uh, and I probably should have looked on her side of the bed because she probably had 30 of them over there. But I really I beautiful. The, yeah, she has. She's very devout, you know, just just very devout practicing Catholic. But I opened the bedside table and I found Father Larry's Be a Man book that my father-in-law had given me years before. And I'd underlined the first three pages was going to change my life and then succumb to the drugs. So I opened that book and I read it from cover to cover that night. When my wife got up. She said, what are you doing up so early? And I said, I never went to sleep. I'm trying to learn how to be the man that you deserve, the man I should always been. And she was hurt. She didn't believe a lot of this. But, but she there, didn't believe started, it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah no track yeah. record. So... I started praying every day. I started reading scripture every day. I read 70 Catholic books in that first year. Uh, just, just I was set on fire for the Lord. One of the first days when I, I took my kids to school uh, after I'd come home, I was borrowing my father's Tahoe. I drove them to school and all these people at my work had found out, all these customers. And my work said that I couldn't tell anybody anything until my court appearance it was over with. And so all these customers were hearing, got wind of this. I was in Just Busted magazines and stuff like that. So people saw it. 
and these customers were just you blah 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 blank i'll never buy anything from you again you cokehead you this and so the way of the world was crashing on me well i dropped the kids off at school that morning and i just wanted to hide from the world i wasn't going back to work yet but i saw my pastor walking across the parking lot and i knew he was going to 815 mass so i walked in there never been to a daily mass or a mass by myself ever in my life mm-hmm. i go in there there's about 10 people that are retirement age and there's me a six foot eight 37 year old man walking into this church and all eyes on me i go kneel on the joseph side and i'm just trying to hide in there and father's homily speaks right to me the scriptures are speaking right to me by the time we hit the the liturgy of the eucharist i was in tears i was in a downpour i mean just couldn't control myself i heard every word of the mass i heard a pin drop in there I, i saw the beauty of the mass this thing i ignored for so long in my life thinking about the Denver Broncos game that was coming on an hour later or my grocery list on Sunday or whatever. This was the first time I'd paid attention to all of this. And so the pastor called me up to communion. I didn't want to go. I sat there shaking my head. No. And he called me anyway. I went up there. No he gave kidding. It to me. Wow. Yeah. He pointed me to the blood. I shook my head again. He says, go partake. And so I went over there. I, I took a sip of the blood. I went back to the pew and bear. I knelt there and I prayed like I've never prayed in my life before. I didn't even realize mass had ended. I I was just so deep in prayer. I felt another hand on my shoulder and this time it was a different priest. And he looked at me and he said, John, what are you doing here? Which was a valid question, but I was in tears. And he said, come with me, took me to the confessional, went in there, told him all of my sins. And then as I got up to leave, he said, where do you think you're going? I said, well, I haven't done this very often, but I think this is the, you know, the point where I leave. And he goes, no, you've told me that you're not at work for 30 days so you're going to be here at 8 15. you're going to come to confession every friday and did you notice i didn't have anybody to read the readings you're going to start lecturing i'm going to teach you right after this and so he took me out there i started to learn all these things he has been a spiritual father in my life he was just here sunday for my daughter's first communion he helped save my life but bear i started practicing all these things that i had at a time in my life and a year later that same men's conference comes up and I go, and this time I take it all in. And I meet another guy there that's on fire for the Lord. And he can't explain why he's just going nuts. He's telling everybody all the things he's ever done wrong in his life. I told him, you've been, you, you've had a, a, an encounter with the Holy Spirit. He didn't know what it meant. He asked me <laughs> to take him somewhere. He goes, I'm a cradle Catholic. I have no idea what that means. I know God and I know Jesus. I have no idea about the Holy Spirit. So he asked me to take him to dinner. I finally did, but I felt the weight of all my mistakes. Nobody knew what had happened in my life. None mm-hmm. of Nobody in church. Nobody outside of our families knew. Well, I wound up going to meet with him and I'm thinking, what am I going to tell this guy? I mean, who am I? And the devil was just beating on me with my mistakes, my failures. And who do you think you are trying to tell anybody about Jesus? Mm-hmm. Look at the life you've lived, all that. Uh, you, the accuser, the, the accuser of uh, the father of, of lies, the accuser of man, right, was doing that to me. So next thing you know, I get my Bible out and I've got six pages of notes on the Holy Spirit from the, the breath over the water in Genesis all the way to Pentecost and beyond. I go and I meet with this guy and I tell him and at the end, he goes, wow, this is amazing. You should start a men's group. And I said, I can't, Jay, I can't. And he kept asking again and again and again. I said, I can't. He goes, why won't you tell me why? And Bear, I felt the spirit convict me to tell him what had gone on in my life. And I shared with the first person outside of my family and I expected him to get up and leave, you know, to, to just say, check please and get up. And all he said was, wow, you need to start a men's group. I said, did you not hear what I told you? I was a cokehead for 17 years of my life. I'm not the guy you're looking for. But he convinced yeah. me, and we called 20 guys together in a room a week later, and we formed a men's group. I got up in that room that night, and I told 25 strangers it, everything I just told you. It, it, it's not like you needed to form a men's group for the men's sake, sure. which is part of it, but you needed to have a men's group to form you. Yes. You Amen. know, we need each other. You know, and I know, I know that uh, God doesn't choose the – the most gifted or the most uh, the most learned or the most holy sometimes he just chooses the most willing and yeah. then it's and then it's 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 on the job training right as mm-hmm. you as you grow in the lord and and there's no no better way to to learn the scriptures than to teach the scriptures right you know to to, to share you got to dig deeper but so so then you begin to work with with uh, right off the bat the lord gave you your apostolate you know sure. and we say you know here here in hawaii um I don't know if you've ever surfed, but um, my son Jeremiah, by the way, surfed 85-foot waves, big waves. 
and oh, wow. uh, yeah, and so and I've I've surfed what they used to call big waves, like twenty five foot waves, Waimea Bay, the, the original big wave uh, surf spot. But when you're held down by a big wave, and you're tumbled around, and you really don't know which way is up and which way is down, and you and you bring your body into the fetal position so your arms aren't dislocated, and your legs aren't dislocated. And you relax, and you just have to get tumbled and tumbled and tumbled, and you don't know which way's up and up or down. And sometimes, though, you get pushed down so hard that you touch the reef, you touch the bottom, and that's a good thing because you know, you know which way is up. Yeah. And f- there's some men out there right now that have touched bottom, you know, that have reached bottom, and by listening to you, they're saying, "There's hope for me." And uh, when we come back, I want you to, we're going to lead them in a prayer. Uh, you men, sure. you know who you are, you men that are listening, women too. And you're kind of at that, that, as we said earlier, you're at the end of your rope. You're at the, the bitter end. Or you feel you've been tossed around by a wave and you don't even know which way is up. We're going to help you get grounded. We come back with John Edwards. We're going to pray for you and, uh, and ask the Holy Spirit to begin to uh, set you free and set you on a new path. Uh, if you want to find John Edwards, where do we find you again? It's just a guy on the pew.com. I love that. We just the just a guy in the just a guy in the pew.com. We need those men in the pew to step up and start to um, to take their role uh, as servant leaders. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Hey man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. Mahalo for your kokua in supporting us. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to you, our listeners, for supporting the Bear Wozniak adventure radio show at deepadventure.com. We would not be able to bring you our radio show with its uniquely powerful and gritty outreach Without your help, you can become part of our pack. You can support our ministry by going to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak or by just going to deepadventure.com and clicking on the Patreon link and become a part of our outreach. That's deepadventure.com. Once again, mahalo for your kokua. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Our guest today is John Edwards. Uh, you know, I've been in a situation where I was pedaling my bicycle across the United States, and it was super, it was like ridiculously hot. It was record-breaking heat for the first eight days. And going over the coastal mountains and then over the Rocky Mountains and through the desert before I got to San Antonio, I think it was 10 days of record-breaking heat. And uh, and I would just, I, I learned then that the key is that the moment that you enter into a desert, uh, you're on your way out, and you have to realize that it's just one downward pedal stroke at a time. What I mean by that is, I know a lot of you have put yourself really in a difficult position. And the key, when you and when the key, the, the, the catechism teaches us that when you live a life of virtue, it gives you a life of ease. 
Well, what they mean by that is when you make a lot of wrong decisions, uh, your life gets harder. <laughs> you get bound <laughs> up in knots, and you paint yourself into a corner, and it gets more and more and more difficult. And the key is, I was talking with someone recently who had he had a, he had a uh, drug uh, alcoholic, uh, lost his temper, got in a fight, broke his arm, his shoulder, so he couldn't work. I uh, was losing his house, losing his job, and I told him the key is to make one good decision at a time. It's a series of little decisions, like one pedal stroke at a time. When I crossed the the uh, when I went from San Diego to Jacksonville, or a paddle the Molokai Channel, it's 28 miles, very treacherous sea, but one paddle stroke at a time. So we're starting right here, right now, with a decision. It's the first of many little decisions. Uh, virtue is seek, uh, is to is to uh, the prudence. The virtue of prudence is to understand what the true good is in every situation, and then with the virtue of, prud of fortitude to pursue that. So this is a decision that John's going to lead you in to commit your life to Jesus. And remember, you're not doing this alone. Jesus is here with you. The Holy Spirit is with you to confirm you strongly. But John, would you lead us in a, in a prayer for those who right now said, I've come to the end of the rope and I want to make a decision to give my life 100% to Jesus. Let's start with that decision. I'd be honored. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for each and every one of these people listening to the show right now. Lord, each and every one of us has had hard times in our life. We've been led to places of great suffering, a lot by our own decisions, a lot of times by our own choices. Lord, in those choices, a lot of times we can feel like there's no way out, like that there's no one that can help us, no, that we, no one that can understand. The devil convinces us that we're the only alcoholic, we're the only person with a drug problem, we're the only person with a pornography addiction. But Lord, those are more lies from the devil. Lord, help us to remember each and every one of us that you are here with us always, much like that father and the prodigal son. You were looking down that long road and you're rejoicing to see your sons, your daughters are turning to you, coming down that road, and you rush out to meet them just like that father in the parable. And there isn't chastising, there isn't rebuke, there isn't uh, uh, just just it, punishment of any sorts. It's nothing but rejoicing, a pouring out of your love, a putting on of your ring, of your of your of your coat, and a, a calling for the slaughtering of, of a fattened calf for the return of a son. So often we feel like you could be disgusted with us, Lord, but you were never disgusted with us. Lord, help each and every one of these men that are listening now and these women, anyone that's struggling with any sort of problems in their life that have made bad choices, remind them of your love for them, of the great links that you went to them for them by giving up the one thing you love most, your only son, for them. And you would have done it if it was only them on this planet. Father, wrap us in your loving arms. Call us home. Give us the strength to persevere, the fortitude to live a virtuous life so that we can become holy and be with you forever. Father, right now, I ask you to help cast out any of these things that are troubling these men, that are binding these men, that you would help break these chains and lead them back to a life full of virtue and righteousness and a heart that is truly given over to you. We ask this all in your name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. There's a scripture verse that says, I know what I have in store for you. Plans for peace, not destruction. A few, a future reserved for you, full of hope. Yeah. If you seek me, I will let you find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me. Jesus wants your heart. Jesus wants your heart. They ask Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? You should love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, strength, and mind. And we talk about the seven virtues, you know, the four cardinal virtues, but the three theological virtues, the four cardinal virtues you kind of hang on are kind of like prudence, justice, self-mastery, fortitude, are kind of discipline type of virtues. But G.K. Chesterton said the good thing about the theological virtues is you can just run wild. You yeah. can never have enough faith or enough hope or enough love. And he said, what, what is hope except for in a hopeless situation? Why do you need hope except for in a hopeless situation? You may feel hopeless, but God's with you. And God's bigger than the bully on the block that's been beating you up. You know, he's uh, there's this, this picture of this young kid who's having to face down a bigger bully. 
and suddenly the bully runs and behind him his big brother shows up you know the little boy's <laughs> big brother that's who jesus is to you he's he's there he's not against you he's for you he wouldn't have initiated by becoming man and dying on the cross and resur- being resurrected remember jesus took satan's enemy and slew him with it he took the the the, 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 the his weapon of death and killed Satan, destroyed Satan. Dying, you destroyed our death, rise, and you restored our life. This very thing that has been a trap to you, Satan will fall into. Um, the, the Bible says, David said, my enemy built a trap and fell into it. So this very thing that's been trapping you will be the, will be the thing that the enemy falls into, and God will free you from. And now, some of you have, have fallen into that trap, and God will free you from that and is bringing you out of that. But some of you... Maybe God wants you to, to prevent you from falling in. You know, you could be saved out of something or saved from something. So many of you have been living a virtuous life, but you're kind of saying, you know, I've been doing it all the right things, punching all the right tickets. I've lived a good life. I've been good to my family. But is that all there is? I, 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 you know, I want something more. And yes, there is more. And that is to fall in love with Jesus, to have a personal Amen. relationship with Jesus. And John did it right. Um, so many men. I know they begin that by going to confession. They go to confession and they meet uh, the, the sacramental graces of, of forgiveness. And I know it's scary. I know like going to confession can be extremely scary. Big old strong man, scared. It's like, but it's, it, it's, it is like skydiving. If you've ever been skydiving before you get on the plane, you're like, oh no, I don't want to jump out of this plane. Uh, but you, you know you will yourself to put on the jumpsuit and then the parachute and then you will yourself to walk into the plane and then all of a sudden there you are you're in the plane and you're about to open up your heart to this priest and, and tell him all the most horrible things you know hopefully maybe you go out of town to some priest who doesn't know you but i remember being on the plane once with one of my sons when we were going to jump and there was a guy on the plane uh, with us and everyone had jumped and now we were making circle back because my son and i wanted to jump out together and hang out you know and this one guy lost his bowels. I mean, he, he lost it. This, the airplane just stunk. And he didn't jump. But believe me, Jeremiah and I were ready, and we wanted to get out of that plane, and we jumped. It's a leap of faith. You don't want to wallow in that stink of your own fear and misery. It's a leap of faith. And if you go, if you confess your sins to the Lord, especially if you go to a priest, there is that kind of fear factor. But once you make that leap of faith, I've never seen anybody jump out of an airplane, the videos I've seen, where they're not, screaming with joy and screaming with laughter and screaming with freedom and i always love to meet people the first time they jump and you meet them on the ground they go how do you feel like bring it what's next i can conquer the world that's what (laughs) confession will do for you go to confession receive the grace of the holy spirit and then and then just say the 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 words to the lord what's next lord and it may be well like what john said hey john we gotta we gotta leave here in a moment um sure really just you got 30 seconds Find your website and talk about the new virtue program that you put together. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So just a guy on the pew.com, you can find everything there, podcast videos, uh, in the narrow road. The narrow road is a guy that we put together that guys can can sign up for. It's twenty dollars a month. It comes right to your door. It's gonna lead you through the daily gospel readings. It's gonna lead you through a different virtue every month. There's an opportunities for grace chart in there with simple things like morning prayer, daily mass, confession, adoration, time with my wife, time with my kids. All these things where you can keep track of what you're doing in your life. You can look at the positive of your spiritual life and you can grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ through prayer, through scripture, and through living out virtue in your life. You could say you want to be virtuous all you want, but until you pick one and you start working at it, it's never going to take. Yeah, and you need to be with other men. And that this also brings yep. you into that Amen. framework. And what's the website again? Just a guy in the pew.com. Love it. We love just the guys in the pew. And we want to invite you to go to deepadventure.com, become part of what we're up to, too. You can go to our web store. We got so many great stuff at our web store, including my two books. And I'm, I'm like you, John. I love to teach on the virtues. My sure. most recent book, uh, um, Deep in the let's see, Deep Adventure, the Way of Heroic Virtue, Sophia Institute is going to be coming out with again soon. So, um, anyway, we love you, John. I'm, yeah. This is like uh, we just blew through this 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 uh, this hour together. Until next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you, aloha. Hey man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. 
go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe, get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out.